All right, so it's 11.05, we'll get started. <clears throat> so good morning and welcome. Thank you all for joining us today to learn about cybersecurity preparedness in healthcare. My name is Chris Newarth and I'll be hosting today's discussion. Before we begin, there are a few housekeeping items I'd like to review to ensure your particip participation today is stress-free and enjoyable. Right now, everyone is in listen-only mode and your microphones have been muted. If you have any questions, please submit them in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen and we'll address them as they come. Please note this is, webinar is being recorded and you'll be able to access the recording online via our website later this week. Lastly, this training is recommended for one CEU for both the ISC2 and ISACA organizations. If you're currently a CSIP, CISA, CISM, or any other silly sounding IT acronym from those organizations, you may submit your certificate of participation for one CEU towards your recertification cycle. For any other organization, we welcome and encourage you to do the same, although I don't know if CEUs will be awarded. We will do our best to provide you with any and all documentation you may need to receive credit for joining us today. Now that we've covered all of those housekeeping items, allow me to formally introduce us. My name is Chris Neuer, and I'm a senior penetration tester and ethical hacker here at Networks Group. For more than 20 years, I've served in a variety of offensive and defensive cybersecurity roles across healthcare and public health organizations, including one of the top academic medical centers in the country. If you're just learning about Networks Group for the first time, we're an ethical hacking and managed security services provider with practices in offensive security, defense, de, excuse me, defensive security, and compliance. The company was founded in 1997, and we just recently celebrated our 25th anniversary. Joining me today is Dave Musilevich and Daniel Parker. Dave is a recognized offensive cybersecurity expert who currently serves as the engineering manager for Dragos. Dave previously worked for US Cyber Command where he led a 60 person team conducting operations against enterprise level networks. Dave also served at the NSA as a software developer and as a red team lead for the US Air Force, emulating nation state cyber threats to assess our governmental defenses. For today's discussion, Dave is representing himself and his views, opinions, speculations, pontifications and diatribes are his and his alone. They do not represent those views and opinions of his current or previous employers or that of the United States government. Daniel Parker is a senior penetration tester for Networks Group. Prior to joining the team, he worked for Deloitte as a cybersecurity manager, where he led a team that developed a platform to integrate and manage big data from disparate cybersecurity data sources. Dan served 20 years in the United States Air Force and had assignments as a software developer, Air Force Red Team member, and as a cybersecurity warfare officer for the NSA and US Cybercom. <clears throat> the agenda and format for today is quite simple. There are three categories of topics that Dave, Dan, and I will discuss with a number of leading questions to get us started. By the end of our time together, we expect that you will have a better understanding of how hackers view your environment and how you can better protect your healthcare organization from them. At the very end of our time together, we'll share with you three free tools that we use as hackers that you can use to defend your organization. So please hang around, you won't wanna miss that. Now, with all of that being said, let's dive into our topic for the day, cybersecurity and healthcare. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you both? Morning, Chris, good. Thank you for that introduction. Yeah, good, thanks, Chris. Welcome, welcome. I think it would have been easier if we simply just said we're all professional hackers. A bit quicker. Right. So um, let's begin by looking at some of the recent headlines. So over the past few weeks, as I'm sure you're both familiar, we've seen several cyber attacks against hospitals, um, one of which, by all accounts, appears to be one of, if not the largest, on a U.S. healthcare system to date. I know personally, I'm not terribly surprised, um, but I want to get your thoughts. You know, is this <clears throat> uptick that we're seeing in cyber in cyber attacks across the healthcare industry um, something we should actually be concerned about, or is this uh, you know typical media hype and there's really nothing there? Um, you know, what are your thoughts? 
Sure. So Chris, uh, I'll kind of jump in on that um, first, but the, so I'll say that there's, I mean, there's always a, an era of, of hype, right, in the media, um, right, they always want to make things, you know, kind of blow them out of proportion, which kind of really, I think, makes it tough for us to really suss out, right, what's actually important and what's just, you know, that media hype. Um, a lot of the stuff that we've been seeing, I think, pivoting recently, though, I find extremely concerning for multiple reasons. Um, but as, as you start to see attackers pivot towards, like, the healthcare industry, um, medical type, you know, targets, uh, it makes a lot of sense just because of how lucrative these targets can be, right? Um, the medical industry, right, I mean, from, you know, billions and billions of dollars, it's, uh, you know, whether that's in patents, whether that's in um, a lot of the, the new technologies, and people pay for it, right? I mean, these are the things that people, they get life-saving care, right? So um, it's like the, one, the number one spot where people are willing to spend, uh, you know, as much money as they possibly can um, right to, to see results from. So it's extremely lucrative, uh, not to mention, you know, the recent pandemic with COVID and all of the, the changes that we've seen, you know, put on or the strain that's been put on this, um, the industry, you know, so not only do you have, right, the pandemic, which puts a lot of strain on the industry, because now you have um, a lot more right, sick individuals that are needing care, but then you also have a lot less people who are um, able to go into the industry, right? Whether that's you know disruption to the different supply chains and that kind of thing. So there's all kinds of things that are making it to where I think the medical industry is under uh, I think extreme kind of like expansion slash growth, but also being hampered in various ways all at the same time. Um, so that makes it you know right from that aspect, you know we kind of discussed a little bit of just how lucrative of a target this is, uh, and then lastly, um, and Dan, um, I know he's got some red team experience as well, but Right, drawing us to the Red Team experience, when we were even going after government networks, um, the medical networks were always off limits, right, for the most part. Um, you're not allowed to go after them because they are so critical because, right, again, they're providing life-saving care. And because people don't truly understand a lot of whether it's how the networks are working or how the technology works, you know, they don't want to touch it, right, because of the, the extreme repercussions or risks that are associated with that. And um, so, again, like when we were Red Teaming, we weren't even, we weren't even allowed to touch these networks. So, not only were, were we not allowed to help them understand what was going on or what an attacker might or may not do, um, right? But they don't understand it either. Uh, and again, this was back during my, my red teaming days, but, um, you know, so it's extremely hard to defend it, you know, and combined with all those other things. Uh, again, I'll, I'll kind of wrap it up there, but um, it makes for such a, a, a lucrative target, like I was saying, that we should not be surprised at all that we see a lot of focus and pivoting towards this. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Dan. Yeah. What, what, yeah. I, I don't have a lot to add. I think that Dave really summed up kind of everything that we're seeing in this industry. I mean, it's it's kind of a intersection of the opportunity, right? There's a lot of low hanging fruit there for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons being that if you look at healthcare, just like any other, you know, for example, in the government, we have a lot of programs of record. So an, essentially, a lot of bespoke or very specific software applications that were developed for a use. A lot of those are in the healthcare world. And as you know, if you have a system that was designed for a specific operating system, if they update it and it breaks. So it's really keeping a lot of those legacy systems out there that which makes the the attack surface area a, a, lar a lot larger than maybe other companies who can afford to just upgrade all of their software where they don't have a lot of those critical systems. So it's a combination of the opportunity and as Dave mentioned, just this um, lucrative, uh, essentially business that attackers have been able to monetize their attacking. I think um, we were discussing this yesterday where, you know, before attackers had a really difficult time to monetize, you know, their actions in previous generations prior to the advent of ransomware. And as ransomware emerged on the market, so did, um, you know, cryptocurrencies, this ability to kind of pay in a decentralized anonymous way. And, um, I think that we're going to continue to see an increase. Now, one of the things that that uh, you know we do have to consider here, you know, I don't think any hackers, at least folks that are trying to mon monotonize their efforts, are really trying to hurt anybody. But you know, uh, in the worst case scenario uh, for a nation state going after you know a particular country, like this is something that you know the healthcare industry should take seriously because even if the intent is not to hurt anybody you know the the very fact that anything can be disruptive that could actually cause those kinetic effects 
sh you know, should give the uh, healthcare industry folks uh, pause, you know, going forward in terms of how they're approaching this problem. Yeah, you know, there, there are a few things you both said that, you know, I wanted to dive into a bit further. Um, Dave, you know, you had mentioned, you know, historically healthcare, you know, these are off limits as far as offensive cybersecurity. You know, too much is on the line. There's active healthcare delivery occurring. Uh, you know, this is, it's not like, you know, it, it's, you're not going to pen test an airplane in flight, you know, something like that. Um, and yet, um, you know, coming from healthcare organizations, you know, I think to myself, is, is our healthcare organizations really any more uh, fragile or, 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 or sensitive compared to any of any other of the critical infrastructure industries, you know, there, there's active offensive security pen testing of, of nuclear power plants, uh, you know, the electrical grid, you know, all these other, um, arguably, you know, sensitive, uh, infrastructure and, you know, the, the, the idea that we should just, you know, assume healthcare is so fragile, we shouldn't even attempt offensive cybersecurity activities around it seems um, defeatist, you know, like, you know, let's just take it for what it is and walk away. Um, you know, how do you reconcile that? You know, how do you approach C-level executives in these, you know, these, these enormous healthcare enterprises who are caring for thousands, tens of thousands of people, you know, every given day, week, month, you know, and balance, you need offensive cybersecurity to get ahead of these, you know, cyber threat actors. And, you know, the, 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 the off chance that something negative happens during offensive cybersecurity is worth the risk. You know, we're professional hackers. We can do this with surgical precision. You know, we're not going to be attacking, uh, you know, an active angioplasty. Uh, you know, while the patient's on the table, you know, we can secure your environment in other ways. You know, how do you balance this? What, what does that discussion look like with C-level executives? You know, how do you get them to see past this hospitals are too fragile to, to test? So I would say that with, I mean, it's a great question. Um, and I would say a decade ago, we were in a situation where um, we as a society, where I think a lot of people could kind of bury their heads in the sand, right? There was a lot of the, you know, crying wolf, a lot of the, the hyperbolic, right? I think in the cyber community, um, we do ourselves a, a great service and a great disservice where we like to, to jump up and down and talk about how important we are, right? Like, hey, like I can do anything with cyber, right? I can kill people with cyber. Like it's, I can tell you firsthand, it's extremely hard to kill somebody with cyber. Like it's, um, you know, it's not really as much of a thing as, as people like to, to claim, right? Back to the news and, and and blowing things out of proportion, but um, right, but there is a serious risk and a lot of damage that can actually be done using cyber. Uh, so, um, but ten years ago, I think a lot of people right they were able to bury their head in the sand. A lot of people didn't quite understand it. When you're talking about um, maybe some C level executives, you know, twenty years ago, they didn't grow up with the same technology that I think you know now more of our, our C suite folks would have, right? Where um, you know they have a lot more exposure to these technologies, you know, just to, to cyber in general, and it's in the news and. I guess, fortunately or unfortunately enough, in the past you know, 10 years, there have been these extremely high profile attacks and they've happened again and again and again. And we can see that it's not, um, you know, I know that there's different charts and there's different reports that come out every year, that this stuff isn't slowing down, right? It's not necessarily, I mean, it's getting better in ways, but you can't just bury your head in the sand in hopes that it's just not right? it's gonna pass over you. Like you're not gonna be the, the one to win the lottery. It's, it's kind of the other way around, right? If you're not being proactive, then you are going to be the one that's going to be hit because, um, right, it's a, it's a numbers game. It's a scale, uh, you know, kind of economies of scale where, um, you know, these attackers, they don't, you know, again, a lot of times we like to build up, I think, hackers and attackers as um, these extremely, like, eclectic, brilliant people when the vast majority of them, right, I mean, this is their job, right? They just do this. This is how they make their living. This is how they make money. They have no interest in impressing people. Uh, and I mean, other than their boss, um, but we'll actually cover that later, you know, kind of in some of the other you know, future questions that we have prepared. But um, so, you know, number one, it's not a question of, you know, can I bury my head in the sand and hope this thing blows over? It's just a matter of when. And 
when you start to articulate like, okay, like, do you want to be, you know, the C-level executive who does have, you know, deaths at your institution or your hospital, right? Because we are talking now about, you know, kind of life and death situations where, um, you know, because of the lack of security, right? Because your network does get ransomware because some someone opened a spear phishing, you know, email that released ransomware in the network, um, right? Now there are deaths and then, you know, there's absolutely going to be investigations and, and you know how how did this happen and how could this have been uh you know prevented and you know come to find out well that was just because of extreme lack of security and right, they just got hit because they were lowest hanging fruit right nobody wants to be that so i think kind of over that last you know decade or two that mind shift of just how prolific in the exposure here um and as dan pointed out with the ransomware of, of how it's so easy to monetize these things now that, um, right, the medical industry is becoming such more of a lucrative target. And um, just to kind of piggyback on the last question a little bit was, unlike almost every other industry, um, in the medical industry, you can, you can kind of get payoffs at almost every level, right? Like there is every level of the victimhood here, everyone has some, some stake in the game. Whereas, you know, if I were to, let's say, hack into a credit card, um, you know, company, right? And steal all the credit cards and socials, um, right? The credit card companies absolve almost all of that risk, right? Back in the day when, you know, credit cards, if somebody stole your credit card and was charging up, you may be held responsible. Those days are, are long gone, right? If my credit card's stolen, I pretty much call my credit card company and be like, hey, you know, somebody's charging and they absorb all of those costs. Uh, but in the medical industry, right? You have medical records. There's very, you know, extremely sensitive information that I may not want to be revealed or be out there. And so if I'm going to, you know, kind of use ransom to kind of, um, you know, extort individuals, um, I, mean, I can do that at the individual level. I can do that at the hospital level. I can do that at the doctor level. I can do that at the federal level. Um, you know, there's, so I have the, the, the amount of potential victims that I can draw, you know, funds from, again, talking ransomware, um, where it's just purely about the money, right? Uh, I mean, there's a reason why these they have help desks, right? I mean, you can call up the ransomware help desk to, to have them help you pay, you know, to get your things back. Um, and it's because it's lucrative for them. So um, anyway, sorry, I kind of went up in a lot of tangents. Hey, stuff, hey Dave, if, if I may. So one of the things we kind of glossed over in the beginning was kind of what you're doing now in your current position. So um, you're literally working on the cutting edge of a relatively nascent space with respect to its cybersecurity. And we're talking operational technology, industrial control systems, SCADA systems, et cetera. What principles there are you trying to apply that you think are also applicable in healthcare? There seems to be a lot of carryover here in terms of what we're talking about, the criticality of a particular system. So what are you seeing um, that you think would be applicable to those out there in the healthcare industry, what you're seeing right now in operational technology, ICS, et cetera? You're muted. Okay, am I going through now? Okay. Um, yeah, I was gonna say, absolutely. There's a huge crossover between, you know, OT and, and the healthcare um, industries. So um, right in my job at Dragos, that's actually one of the reasons when I first got out of the, you know, the military and kind of out of the government space, um, right now I was always, you know, where am I going to land? What am I going to do with all these skills? And um, where I wanted to go was somewhere where I could be my own worst nightmare, uh, you know, because I wanted to to use the things I would have hated to see, and I want to build those to protect, you know, critical infrastructure. And um, right, Dragos really likes to focus on that. And uh, right, healthcare definitely falls within that as well. So one of the ways that um, you know, again, the thing that that and not to you know go too much into the Dragos side of the house, but um, what we're doing in the OT space there is right. So passive monitoring. Is I think one of the number one things you can do, because uh, when you like pass like for monitoring your network, just to understand like understanding your network um, is extraordinarily vital. Because I guarantee you that just by not understanding your network, it doesn't protect you in any way. Um, right, your adversaries are going to learn your network ten times better than you will. Um, so uh, there was actually a, a funny story of um, one of an associate of mine. Um, they were doing a pen test of, of their own network at one point, and they found a Solaris box right on the network that you know, nobody knew existed. They found the Solaris box, and they were looking for this thing physically, and they couldn't find it, right? Because, and this is an old, I don't know, probably 10 years old at the time, right? So extremely vulnerable, and it gave a foothold for any adversary who wanted to get into that, 
um, into that server, which by the way, was internet facing, right? So um, you could gain remote access into the network this way. And when they finally found it and they were searching for days, um, it turned out that they had, it had been plastered and walled. It was in a room like where there was no doors or anything. It was like, it was in literally a wall. Um, and nobody knew that this thing existed. And yet it was extremely vulnerable and providing a foothold into their entire network. Uh, and, you know, they wouldn't have known that this thing was even there. Um, so understanding your network is, is absolutely critical. And there's many things, you know, to do that. Uh, among, you know, one of which is, is right, a pen test and um, just kind of vulnerability assessment, just to find out like, what is on this network, right? What is, what does the thing look like from a, from a black box perspective? I think people really underestimate, um, in fact, during some of my red team time, when we do tabletop exercises, they really underestimate how hard it is to truly know your network because um, it's constantly changing. You have, uh, you know, as we, we've discussed, I think um, at other times, all the different layers of security, right? So everyone that touches the computer is a potential vector into this network. And so you have the layer all the way down from you know, your secretary all the way up to your C-suite, you know, level individuals and the customers and everybody, um, right, are all potential targets and potential vectors. And so those, that access is so large um, that it's really, really hard to just keep tabs on that. Uh, but that's kind of, you know, the number one thing is, is understand your network and in the OT space, what we're doing to, to kind of help solve that is, is really, so passive listeners of network traffic um, is one of the ways that, that Dragos really specializes in. And so a, a passive tap, right, if you're an attacker and things are just listening on the network, uh, and I don't know that as an attacker, I mean, it, it's hard to, to avoid that, right? I can't, um, you can't lie on the network like you can, I mean, there's ways to deceive, right? But if I'm gonna be sending bits on the network, I can't hide that. They're going to be there for somebody to look at. And if I'm not aware of where these, these passive sensors may be detecting my activity, um, it can be really hard to, to avoid them, right? Just like in any other, um, I wanna say any other sport, any other expertise or anything, there are times when you need to, you know, really pay attention and have good tradecraft. And there are times when you, when you don't, right? Where you can relax. And it's really, really, really hard to be on your game at all times. And that's when you start to see almost the differentiation between these different APTs or these different threat groups is, right, how, how much do they mess up? Everybody's going to mess up. Um, but trying to be on your game and making sure you're always using good tradecraft. But even, you know, these super sophisticated you know, APTs, there are times when they're not going to want to employ, you know, different tradecraft. And... This is when, you know, even as, uh, as a red teamer, when we would emulate different threat groups, um, you want to make sure that you are using the right TTP for the right time, right? Or the right tool for the right time. Because as I kind of alluded to before, they have zero interest in impressing you or impressing the news. And the more interesting you are, the more likely you are to get detected, right? If I throw a not sled exploit across the wire, right? It's extremely easy to detect that it's significantly harder for you to detect me logging in with the user credentials because that's what users are meant to do. They're meant to log in. Um, I always like to, uh, I always thought it was kind of funny when I would, you know, talk about, you know, whether what I was doing or talk about the red team engagements that we would perform. And, um, you know, people would always think it sounds very sexy, right? But if you were to like walk, like look over my shoulder and I mean, nine times out of 10, I mean, I could, you know, my wife could do the stuff that I'm doing. I'd be like, oh, you know, here's the username and password. Go RDP into the network. <laughs> you know, like, um, it doesn't look sexy, but that's the point, right? Because Shh, the we're giving away all our secrets here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, yeah, so, so what I hear you saying here is, like, asset discovery, asset management Absolutely. is a key, you know, in, in, in OT, that's kind of like a new thing, right? That hadn't really been done before at a sufficient level. Um, so in the government, we have this concept called mission relevant terrain or mission relevant terrain cyber. So essentially it means it's like, how do we map out all of the key critical systems? What's our critical infrastructure? Even more than that, what are the dependencies? So if that system goes down, what are the dependent systems that are in what effect with the second, third order effects? Now, Chris, I can turn this back to you as well. So a lot of these networks, especially OT networks, are ostensibly air-gapped. And they find when they bring a, a penetration test in there, they're like, okay, you said this was air-gapped, then why do I see this Xbox calling out to the internet? Like, 
and I would imagine, as I'm, I'm not a healthcare expert, I haven't worked in healthcare before, Chris, but I would imagine you have, you know, similar experiences within healthcare. You know, with healthcare, and, and this is a great segue into our second question here. Um, let me let me pose the question, and we're going to continue this discussion. Um, just last month, we saw CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency, issue this binding operational directive, 2301. Now, this directive is is for U.S. federal agencies. Uh, requiring them to regularly conduct asset and vulnerability discovery on their respective networks, literally what we were just talking about. And you know, here's an example where I feel that the government's getting ahead of the private sector um, and recognizing the importance of what you just said, Dave, going out there and truly understanding your network. Now, up until this point, you know, I'm not sure we, we've truly level set why healthcare is as vulnerable today or is more vulnerable today than arguably at any point. And I think, you know, now would be better time than ever to, to kind of lay out that, that, you know, that picture. And, uh, you know, Dave, you pointed out a number of times, and, and in fact, Dan, you'd um, emphasize some of these points as well. Um, but again, to bring this all together, we have, you know, the healthcare industry is post pandemic. There is a mass um, exodus of, of clinical providers um, at all levels leaving the space. That's pushing the remaining clinical providers to leverage technology two, three, four, tenfold as a force multiplier. There are hospitals uh, proceeding with acquisitions. There's a lot of money being diverted to other priorities instead of rebuilding their workforce. Uh, just to you know, remain competitive in the space. There's this enormous push for telemedicine, uh, you know, all of these remote services. There's priorities for EMS to extend the operations of emergency departments with mobile stroke units. You know, all of these competing priorities that are that are distracting and consuming funds that otherwise could be funneled towards cybersecurity. And so when you have these competing priorities that are in fact all, you know, that this, the, the, the commonality amongst these competing priorities is that they're all not cybersecurity, you end up with this, this evolution of healthcare at such a pace that, you know, the folks that are, that are stuck doing cybersecurity are standing there, you know, wondering how am I possible, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't secure the environment to start and now you're expanding and building at a pace that's incomprehensible. And here we have a directive saying, go map your external attack surface, go understand what's connected to your network. And the IT folks are standing back saying, okay, well, this is great. We now have a health enterprise that spans 17 counties and three states. And you're you know, bringing on uh, you know, physicians offices and specialties and, and all of these outpatient centers that are connecting back to our network, how, where do we even begin? And so, you know, the question is, and, you know, I think the answer is implied, should hospitals be doing this absent a mandate? You know, and if so, you know, where do you even begin? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and as, as you kind of said, I think it's kind of, you know, almost implied that, um, yeah, asset, you know, to really put a, a, you know, an actual point on it, you know, that understanding of the network, but like asset um, identification is absolutely critical. Uh, again, back over at Dragos in the OT space, that's exactly, that's, I mean, step number one is, right, you have to identify your assets before, you know, you can do anything else, right? I mean, how can you protect something you don't even know exists? So, um, and one of the things that I think you really started to, to kind of get at there that is also, you know, not to just sit here and appreciate the problem too much, but um, in the OT space for a lot of the other, uh, the other sectors, let's say the energy sector, um, I think people inherently understand that, you know, all these are critical infrastructure and those types of things, but the scope of what is actually included there is much smaller, right? An electrical power plant, let's say, for example, whereas in the medical industry, right, everybody wants medical care from their phone. So now you, you're talking about, you know, when you, you mentioned attack surface, I mean, the attack surface is you know, a thousand fold what some of these other industries are and which make it just that much more important. And because again, as I kind of mentioned earlier, the dynamic nature of, of networks as it is, 
when you are constantly introducing and you're in this rapid expansion of the industry, you know, so you're, you're constantly expanding, trying new technologies, trying to get this, you know, further down to the user, to their individual devices. Um, you know, your attack surface is consistently changing, it is consistently growing, and in ways that people never probably thought about, um, considered, or anything like that. So, um, you know, where do you even start? Uh, I would say it really kind of goes back to, you know, you start with, it, it's, it's really a long journey. Um, and that's where I think people definitely need to, to always have it in their head that this is always a journey that's constantly evolving. There is no, you know, end state. You're not going to reach like, I am safe and secure forever, um, right? It's just realistically not going to happen until, as I'm sure many have heard, you turn off the computers, right? Um, so, you know, where do you start? You start with, you know, kind of like you alluded to those, those assessments, those, those penetration tests, um, you know, and that can really give you that foundation of, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that my attack surface was this large. I didn't even realize that this was an attack surface. You know, this was part of my attack surface. Um, people can do that internally as well. I don't want to by any means say that, you know, internal penetration teams, you know, can't even do this. But the biggest problem with trying to do that is the amount of expertise that you need to, to really do that. I mean, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of energy, and it's extremely expensive to grow that in-house. Um, you know, whereas, you know, there's a bunch of different other options that different companies have offered, um, to try and bring that price point down and trying to grow that internally. And although that that is a very, I think, um, enticing approach, uh, you know, to saddle, like, let's say the IT folks, where people just view computers as, um, as universal. And, you know, let's say 50 years ago, maybe it was much easier where, uh, the amount of knowledge that you had to have um, was was fairly scoped and, and a lot smaller. Um, but now there's so many different you know programming language, different technologies, different layers of abstraction that happen um, that trying to expect folks to kind of dual hat um, right. Even though computers look the same from the outside, um, it really takes an understanding that you know cybersecurity. I mean, there's so many niche skill sets within there. You know, just like um, one of the conversations we've had in the past of, you know, if you have somebody who can drive a car really well, let's say, and, uh, you know, race car driver, um, you know, that same person is not going to be the same person who's a good, let's say, truck driver, or delivery driver, or somebody who's going to drive farming equipment very well. I mean, they're extremely diverse skill sets. Yes, you're driving something and anybody with a license can maybe, you know, drive something, but, you um, you know, trying to, to grow that internally. So that's really where I would say is the biggest start is kind of bring in someone, you know, bring in this expertise as much as you can uh, to kind of help you on this journey to map that out, the asset inventory, um, you know, again, which can happen through many ways, whether that's, uh, you know, maybe black box or white box kind of penetration tests, those types of things. The healthcare analogy yeah. I always use, similar to what you were just saying is, you know, you can, you can, you know, use your phone or you can use WebMD to Google an ailment you may have, you know, and, and, you know, get some insight about, you know, what you should do about it. Health or uh, hospitals can rely on their own internal IT teams to have some idea of where their vulnerabilities are, you know, based on their collective knowledge. But a pen test is like going to get a physical, you know, you're going to someone who has the knowledge, the skill set, the instrumentation to provide you with objective data about your health condition. A pen test is doing the same exact thing for a health organi healthcare organization where we're coming in with skills, you know, uh, the knowledge, uh, the instrumentation to tell you objectively, here's where your attack surface is. As you pointed out, you may not even realize, in fact, this is something that's exploitable. And you know, as you, uh, as healthcare organizations expand at such a rapid pace, to try to keep up with understanding that expansive attack surface, you know, is very difficult. And so the, the natural question, and I'm, I'm sure our attendees are thinking about this, is like, well, well then what? Like, I, I can't accept that. If I'm the CISO of a hospital, I can't just say, well, we're expanding faster than I can understand my attack surface. It's how do I distance my public facing uh, my public facing attack surface from my internal core network or the network that I have my uh, medical devices on or you know the true healthcare delivery aspects of the organization you know is that is it 
segmentation? Is it implementing a DMZ? Is it, you know, putting a certain uh, hierarchy of firewalls? Is it, you know, you know, what, what do we have today that I can begin to mitigate this problem with? while I also try to understand my attack surface, right? I, I mean, I can't do this linearly. We have to work in parallel. What, what can I, you know, if I'm the CISO, what can I start doing now to begin to minimize the risks with my expansive unknown attack surface? Yeah, yeah. and not to interrupt, but, you know, Rachel was asking this question, why are attackers typically so much more adept at understanding a network than its corresponding organization? I think you guys just literally answered that and both of your diatribes. And to, to summarize, it's really hard to grow that talent organically. You expect people to, to be jack of all trades. Um, you know, people are under-resourced, they're overworked. And so you you outsource something like this for a very specific, you know, skill set, which I think you both beautifully captured. So, and I mean, you know, to the ransomware portion, I mean, it pays extremely well. I mean, it's a very lucrative, um, I would say immoral, you know, in many cases, but um, it's very lucrative things. You attract a lot of very intelligent people as well to it. Um, and so, uh, but you know, back to kind of Chris, your point of like, you know, what are some of the things we can do now? Um, and I would say, you know, I don't think I can emphasize it enough of like, right? Like understanding your network is just so critical. And um, yeah, I'm trying to think of, there was another thing you kind of, a point you kind of touched on there a little bit. Oh. Um, right, the segmentation of the DMZs, which, I mean, these security practices are always, you know, things that go really far, um, right, like separation, segmentation, DMZs, and these are things that people have known about for a long time, which is, you know, before this thing kicked off, and we kind of talked about, you know, how there's supposed to be a death of cybersecurity for years and years, um, which I do, I hope that someday I'll have to go find another job, I think the world will be in a better place, but, um, you know, I think it's people a lot of times, even with like the colonial pipeline attack, right? Um, it was kind of funny that people like to think about this was an OT attack. It really it wasn't, you know, the OT system that was actually even being impacted. It was um, because their IT side was so intertwined with the OT side that it shut down all operations, you know, when they got ransomware. So it wasn't even, um, you know, it's so going back to that, you know, segmentation is a very important piece. Um, I would say if you look at, I don't know, nine out of 10 attacks, one of the critical aspects of every one of those attacks are things like, you know, using reuse of credentials. I mean, credentials are so easy um, and hard to detect, right? If I'm reusing credentials, it's very difficult to detect, um, right? Post-mortem, you know, you can see it or you can see when the chain happens, but there's almost always these critical pieces. And so when you can start to implement things like multi-factor authentication, um, it is extremely difficult to, right, not impossible, um, but you're upping the bar when you start to have things like multi-factor authentication you know, as widespread as you possibly can. That human element is extremely difficult to replicate. Uh, and again, you know, back to one of those, like, what are my nightmares as an offensive, you know, individual? Um, I mean, two-factor kind of, I mean, it makes, it, it raises it from, like, you know, a level one skill level of me logging into like you know, level nine kind of things. Cause I'm either gonna have to do something to intercept a text message. I'm gonna have to, you know, I mean, if you're talking hardware tokens, it's, you know, I'm gonna have to go hack RSA, which people have done, um, you know, but it really ups the level of how serious are you about getting this? And, you know, if you're talking just kind of your generic hit ransomware, people just looking for funds, um, a lot of times, right, they're gonna move on to the next target. So, um, you know, if I were to, you know, I think really emphasize some of that would be, you know, understanding your network, but at the same time as you kind of have that going on, you know, things like multi-factor authentication, um, I think it's probably one of the best places I would probably start. I don't know if you guys have any other ideas. You know, it's interesting. I, I was going to say, you know, we have a question here, you know, in our opinion, what, you know, what are the most critical cybersecurity awareness training takeaways for end users? And, you know, I was going to at least in part answer my own question and say, when you have such an expansive um, when you have such an expansive attack surface, um, actually, regardless of how expansive it is, people are always your weakest link. And over the, you know, the past several engagements that I've been on as the attacker, um, I've been able to gain full control of you know, remarkably large corporate networks simply because of, of bad credentials, you know, easy guessable passwords, and also with no two-factor authentication in place. And in some instances, it was because of a really 
uh, you know, straightforward phishing attempt. And so when we talk about cybersecurity awareness training and trying to impose upon the people who are interacting with that edge of your attack surface, that public facing edge, you know, those in the most remote or distant locations of your healthcare, healthcare organization, the secretaries, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, again, all the nursing assistants, even all those folks that are inputting the data, nurses, the doctors who are inputting data into those terminals that are just sitting kind of open, uh, you know, in the doctor's office, some with shared passwords, some with the password on a post-it note, understanding the magnitude of risk in doing that is, is arguably the biggest takeaway that I would impose upon people in any cybersecurity awareness training. I mean, to think that one person sharing one weak password could take down you know, an entire enterprise network where healthcare delivery you know, is occurring 24 seven, people's lives are at stake, a multi-billion dollar enterprise you know, is, is in jeopardy all because of one weak decimal password. I mean, that, that is, you know, it, it's kind of just mind, it's incomprehensible to understand yeah. how that, that order of magnitude impact occurs. Yeah, and if, Go ahead, and if, if I may, I was just gonna say that, you know, um, the, the question was targeted towards end users and I, I agree wholeheartedly with everything that you said, Chris. And one of the things that we like to mention is that um, until there's a cultural shift among everybody in the organization that sees themselves as kind of a frontline cyber defender, a lot of the consequences of people's actions are really not going to be clearly understood. On top of that, it's it's a it's kind of a, a simple understanding of combinatorics, and part of that is the policies that we're instituting. So, for example, somebody thinks, "Oh, I've got an eight-character password, but it's got these special characters in it, so it's super complex." When in fact, somebody would be much better served just to have like a twenty-four character password of just you know random words that you're putting together with maybe a little punctuation in there. It's much easier for the end user to 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 memorize that versus you know you institute all of these really complex policies. And so, what do people do? They find shortcuts. Oh, I'm just going to do a keyboard pattern. Well, guess what? We, you know, we have keyboard patterns fa fairly well mapped in all the different cracking software that we have. So. So it's not completely on the end users. I think you know, you know, CISOs and other security folks have to to really think thoroughly about some of the policies that they're instituting that might incentivize bad behavior. You know, that's it's a really good point because folks um, that we interact with and and uh, penetration tests that we do with health organizations are front and center here. Where to your point, they think you know, an eight character, even a twelve character password policy is sufficient and with the amount of of resources attackers have we have now we're regularly cracking passwords in the 14 15 16 17 18 character limit and that's with complexity um, and we're doing so in a matter of hours and you know i can i can hear the CISOs now saying well you're absolutely out of your mind if you think i'm going to put an 18 character policy out there when I can barely get people, you know, to change their password, anything beyond one increment, um, you know, every 90 days. Um, but, you know, while I, I appreciate that, that, that difficulty, it emphasizes how important properly implemented two-factor authentication is, you know, whether it's, you know, Duo or Octo or whatever it may be. I want to jump ahead now, though, and, and really dive into um, looking at healthcare organizations through the eyes of an attacker. And I think the value here for, for those watching is that sometimes it's hard for those on the blue team to look at their own organizations through the eyes, you know, or in the mindset of a hacker. So let's assume, you know, for discussion purposes, that you're going to attack a large healthcare enterprise, ethically and, and with authorization, of course. Uh, walk me through the process, but at this stage, beginning with the collecting of intelligence, you know, as attackers, how do you gather information on a target and its employees? And I'm going to jump ahead here um, with the graphics. You know, how do you how do you begin to collect information on on an organization and, and begin to understand what your pathway is to attacking them? 
So um, as far as kind of approaching these, it's it's kind of a tried and true method of right, the hacker methodology is just, uh, I mean, I want to say when it was first kind of articulated, but it was years and years ago, but um, it really is the way that you would approach these things. Now, the irony here, though, is I think that a lot of times, again, people like to apply right, like the sexy hacker from Hollywood type of a deal where right, there's a genius in a basement. Like that's not the way that that these operations happen. I mean, these are big, well-funded operations with teams of people that specialize in every one of these phases, right? Um, just because somebody can code doesn't mean that that person can code exploits, right? Just because somebody can come up with exploits doesn't mean that that person has good tradecraft. I mean, they absolutely have specializations within all of these things to make it a very cohesive team. Um, so, you know, when you are uh, one thing, I definitely want folks to take away is. You know, when I when I when I talk through like how I'm going to do this attack, like it's it's not even just me, right? There's you are combating a a team of well-funded, highly motivated individuals who are not interested in um, right in in showing off or in impressing people, right? So that's kind of what you're up against here. Um, you know, and then when you talk about you know kind of the dance point of right the overworked nurse who just came off of let's say. A night shift that she was called in, uh, you know, from home, and she had worked 24 hours prior, right? Um, right. I mean, that's I mean, it's stacked against those individuals. Uh, so, but that's that's and that's really why that's you know the softest link. So that's where where I would start. Um, that's typically where I think most people start, just because it's so it's so easy. Um, it's just such a, a a soft target. You know, people are looking for the exploits coming in over the wire against some public server. That's probably hardened. Uh, but if I can in, um, impersonate an individual that's already supposed to be on that network, I mean, my tradecraft is already, you know, 10 times better just by simply doing that. So spear phishing somebody and gaining access to a network through their, you know, their access vectors, um, I'm already, I already belong. Um, so you, you start by doing that intelligence collection and there's various tools that would do um, an intelligence collection of a, of a, of a company, of a corporation, right? Who works there? Um, you know, what is the email scheme that they use, uh, who are some of the employees, that sort of a thing. And then you, you find some way to, to spear fish that individual is something that's interesting. Um, and back when, when we would do spear phishing campaigns, uh, I mean, again, Dan can attest to this, but we would only have to send out a handful. I mean, it was almost partially laziness where I was like, I'm just going to figure out five people to send this to. I'm going to send it out to five people. I, just, I literally just need one click. I don't need... You know, so four of them are well trained and they they had you know good passwords and good security. Um, right. So it's just that one new individual who is not trained, right? That's all I needed. Um, and then from there I got my foothold, my beachhead, and I'm gonna escalate. Um now, you know, again, the other side of that is if you protect them with that two-factor authentication, that kind of stops that dead in the water, right? It makes it extremely, extremely hard to get that foothold. Um, but that's how that's how I would start is. Right, I mean, you're Googling the information, you're finding out, um, you know, you're, you're, sorry, Google dorking, or you're using like Multigo, right? A lot of these, you know, just public tools um, to kind of just find out what you think the attack surface is, and then you just start poking at them, right? And you just try, you try a hundred different things. I'm sure many people who might be listening to this have heard, right? The attack only has to be right, you know, once ish. I mean, that's kind of true, um, but. Right, they have the luxury of of an infinite amount of time, and a lot of times, in a way, infinite amount of resources. To where you know they may not want to go after you, but if if there is a reason that they need to go after a particular target, right, they can just keep going after it, and they can wait things out. Um, right, they can wait for that ebb and flow of the network security posture to you know find when a door is open and just slip in. Um, so with that being said, you know then once you have that beachhead, you look for uh, right different ways to escalate, and this is where that that asset identification and knowing how your network looks, how it's supposed to look, right? Is it normal for nurses to RDP into your network, you know, at two in the morning? Is it normal for, um, you know, somebody to RDP in from, I don't know, Shanghai, let's say, you know, to my network? Um, you know, if the answer is no, then, you know, maybe you want to investigate that or call that person like, hey, and they're like, you know, maybe they are on vacation in Shanghai. I don't know. But, um, you know, that's really where you, that knowing of the network is so important. And there hasn't actually been, I've never been on any type of network or engagement where I did not definitively know of critical vulnerabilities that they did not know. 
Um, and that can be anything from like, right, the Solaris machine that I talked about that was walled in, you know, behind a, you know, literally in the wall. Or um, there was another case where there was a supposed air gap network that a contractor had came in to do some work and had plugged in, right? Because a lot of times these things are right next to each other, right? Plug one thing into the other for this device and then plug that device into the other side of the network, right? And that device was left there. And I mean, that's all it takes. And now that bridge is there. Um, and another thing, is a lot of people like to view these networks as separated or like, right, they're, they're absolutely segregated, right? They're air gapped. But if that is a logical air gap, then, right, that's, that's a configuration and that's a setting. And if I have access to the same settings and configurations that you just did to air gap this thing, I can undo it, right? It's, um, you know, again, these are very resourceful individuals as well. They're not stupid. So, um, right, you could un-air gap it, go in, and then do whatever it is you need to do, get back out, re-air gap it. Right. And, and no one's the wiser. So um, anyway, hopefully that kind of I don't know if that gave some a little bit of perspective of how you really go after some of these. Yeah. You know, one of the things that that I think is a primary uh, differentiator between healthcare and all the other critical infrastructure uh, sectors is the interdependency between cybersecurity and physical security in healthcare. And what I mean by that is when I'm attacking a hospital, um, I'll do my usual OSINT. I'll look at the employees on LinkedIn, you know, do the normal scouring of information of historical data breaches and so forth, uh, email schema, like you said. But by design, hospitals are porous organizations. They are meant to have foot traffic and have people feel welcomed, um, you know, coming from a, you know, again, a, a top academic medical center in a major metropolitan area where foot traffic off the sidewalk through the main lobby, I mean, it, it looked like, you know, a, a mall during the holidays. People were coming and going unaccounted for without signing in or interfacing with anybody in security. And off they went onto the patient floors, administrative areas. I mean, it was like a mini city in the hospital. And when I'm about to attack a hospital, I can sit in that lobby all day, drink a coffee, you know, quote unquote, wait for a family member to come out of a procedure. And you wouldn't know necessarily I'm casing the area or I'm plugging in a device into the ethernet port, you know, on the side of the chair in the lobby. Um, and I, I think cybersecurity professionals, especially the IT folks in uh, in healthcare organizations are, are quite removed from, from the public safety aspect of it. The, the security, the emergency preparedness folks, the risk management folks, and yet here, within the, the mechanics of cybersecurity in the hospital is a glaring vulnerability in, its, in itself. And uh, you know, perhaps one you know, major takeaway in this discussion among many others is how important in healthcare it is to ensure that the physical security is integrated into the rest of the bigger cybersecurity program. And maybe one of the things too that I think it kind of provides that it provides that I think that false sense of security is when people think like, oh, like I'm going to detect that individual, right? I'm going to see that guy case in the joint. I'm going to see, you know, whatever it is. Or, um, and there's some truth to the aspect of like, you know, if I'm publicly interfering, right, there's a million people that can hit my website to, to attack me, but a million people aren't necessarily like looking at my building, right? Just it's just the numbers game. So there is a physical separation to it. And I think that that, that, but again, it lulls people in that, I think that false sense of security, um, you know, to where like, yes, you're absolutely right. But I think the thing that people forget is that a lot of these individuals, when they actually conduct these type of attacks, they're more mules than anything, right? Like you're not going to get the sophisticated hacker necessarily sitting there in your lobby. You're going to get a mule that he pays off, right? He says, hey, install this app on your phone so he can remote into the phone and he goes, walk into this hospital, right? Or like, I mean, I am sure you can think of a million different ways that people incentivize others to install apps on their phone. Or better yet, you talk about those third-party, um, you know, compromises that have been happening. If you can compromise a third-party app or something, get everybody to download this thing, you can now collect data, and now everybody else is fine for you, and they don't even know it, right? So you can have people in these hospital lobbies, which is, um, you know, collecting all this data. There was actually an app uh, just recently that I... Uh, came across, which I think it's called Wi-Fi Mapper or Wi-Fi Maps. 
Um, but what this does is people download it and they will upload the Wi-Fi SSID and the Wi-Fi password for like any Wi-Fi hotspot that they go to. And it's this public map that everybody's just providing all these credentials. So just because you trusted, you know, one individual with access to your, your network, let's say, they install this app, it siphons out all that data. And now that's public for anybody to use, um, right? So that's where I think it's, it's so paramount that you almost treat everybody as like that potential adversary, not necessarily in a hostile way, but like as untrusted. Um, and they may not even know it. Again, they may be coming in with all kinds of stuff on their phone and have no clue. So anyway. So, so it looks like we're almost at the top or we are at the top of the hour and we promised to share uh, three tools that we use as hackers uh, that hospitals, uh, the blue teamers, can use to defend their organizations. So let's take a look at those. The first tool um, that we regularly use that is much of what we discussed earlier is a tool called Amass uh, from OWASP. Um, hospitals can use this tool to begin mapping their external attack surface and see what's out there. Not only um, can identify um, you know, your public facing assets, it can highlight and identify some of your um, subdomains that may be uh, long forgotten and at risk of a potential takeover. Um, this is one of the first tools I use to begin uh, mapping an external attack surface when I'm going after an organization um, and it never lets me down. It's actively being developed. There's some really bright guys behind this. And um, it's an invaluable tool in our arsenal. Blue Tamer should be using it, especially in hospitals. If you have a fighting chance to understand your um, a, external attack surface, I think this is one of the tools that would get you there. Um, the second tool I would recommend to you all is, uh, and you've likely heard about this uh, if nowhere else in the news, uh, and it's a it's a website. It's a service called Shodan, and um, this is a this is really a database. They claim it's it's like the Google of Internet of Things, um, and you know basically this service, I guess for lack of a better term, scours the internet on a regular basis, and anything public facing is cataloged. And so, if you go to this website, you can search for your IP addresses, your domains, um, and get a sense of whether or not you have anything public facing. Um, just this morning, I simply typed in the term hospital and was surprised that one of the very first results is a hospital I'm, I'm quite familiar with um, right here. So, and it's an organization that is so large, I would expect that they would have known this service was exposed and it probably shouldn't be. So again, it's one of those things, um, everybody is at risk. And uh, this is a tool that I would recommend everybody um, check out, type in some of your, um, some of your information and uh, get a sense if anything is uh, wrongfully or inadvertently exposed. And the last tool that I think would be worth your while is a, a website called hostedscan.com. And you know, we have no affiliation with any of these services. These are just things that are in our toolbox um, when we're attacking. Um, this is a free website scanner. Um, you have to create a free account to use it, but if you go onto this website, you can type in your domain. It will do a passive and aggressive scan. It'll look at a number of um, uh, known vulnerabilities and see if your website has any of them. Um, in healthcare, um, web app exploitation isn't the highest on the list. In fact, it's um, you know third-party vendors having uh, exploited software that you end up installing as being the primary vector. But with the expansiveness or the the um, the likelihood that more healthcare organizations are using web apps to extend their services into the public it's likely you're going to um, need to be doing this more often than you currently are. So this is a tool, again, it's free to use, can give you a quick sense of, do you have any of, of these vulnerabilities? And I would say, if you're finding stuff using any of these three tools, those should be indicators that you probably need a formal pen test. Um, you know, when you start to Google WebMD with all your ailments and, and you start to see a number of things come back as serious, 
that's when you want to go see a doctor. When these tools come back with findings, you come see uh, an ethical hacker to figure out what your next step should be. So with all that being said, um, I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us today. I want to thank our guest, Dave Muselevich, for your time and insights. Um, please check out our blog at networksgroup.com. We have a lot of great information, um, both on offensive security content and um, you know, other technical information that we can, uh, you know, stories from hackers, uh, some insight on how to ace your pen test and so forth. Um, please join us next week, November 22nd. John Parley, the Chief Information Security Officer, will be joining us to discuss purple teaming and validating your detection and response capabilities. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed the webinar, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.